You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Michelle Jewell Shaw, chairperson of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses, a chapter of the American Lighthouse Foundation. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Jeremy, and hello to all of our listeners out there. This is February 13th, 2022, and this is episode 160 of Lighthearted. In a few minutes, we'll listen to an interview about the Noble Maritime Collection, an organization that has a museum on Staten Island, New York, and is also the steward of Robbins Reef Lighthouse in New York Harbor. And later, we're going to have a new Be a Lighthouse segment about a young woman who's been doing good deeds in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. First, has anything interesting happened on the state lighthouse history, Michelle? Yes, Jeremy, it it actually has. On February 13th, 1913, Mia Ma Lighthouse in New Jersey was completed. The cast iron structure was the last offshore lighthouse built in Delaware Bay. The location is named for Nia Maya Ma, who was a Delaware River pilot born in 1837. He died in a boat accident on the shoal, and it was named for him so that he could live on in the memory of local mariners. It's kind of strange that the name of the lighthouse is usually pronounced Mia Mall, but it was named for Nehemiah Mall. Can't quite figure that out, but Mia Mall Lighthouse was auctioned by the federal government in 2015, so it's now privately owned. So, Michelle, let's tell our listeners about the Noble Maritime Collection and our first guest, Megan Beck. Sure, Jeremy. The mission of the Noble Maritime Collection, an art and history museum on Staten Island, New York, is to present exhibitions and programs that celebrate the working waterfront of New York Harbor in the tradition of the distinguished artist John A. Noble. The museum is located on the former grounds of the retirement home known as Sailor Snug Harbor on Staten Island's North Shore. The museum also works to preserve Robin's Reef Lighthouse, a spark plug style tower located between the Statue of Liberty and Staten Island's North Shore. Robin's Reef is best known as the home of the famous Kate Walker, who was its keeper from 1895 to 1919. Megan Beck began working at the Noble Maritime Collection in 2013. She researched and helped develop exhibits on Sailor Snug Harbor and Robin's Reef Lighthouse, and she oversees all curatorial and archival projects for the museum. I had the pleasure of talking with Megan Beck via Zoom a couple of weeks ago. Let's listen to that conversation now. I'm speaking this afternoon with Megan Beck, who is the curator for the Noble Maritime Collection on Staten Island in New York City. Thank you so much for joining me today, Megan. Happy to be here. I really appreciate it. Uh, The Noble Maritime Collection is a museum dedicated to the working waterfront of New York Harbor. The organization is also the steward of Robin's Reef Lighthouse, which I want to talk about in a couple of minutes. But first, Megan, I'd just like to start uh, by learning a little bit about you. Uh, I'm wondering what uh, what was your background and how did you come to be the curator for the Noble Maritime Collection? My background is in American history, um, anthropology. I have a master's in library science, but I actually started here about nine years ago as an intern. And I was given the opportunity to do a lot of hands-on projects, research, exhibitions, all of that real, really important hands-on experience when you're working in this field. And it evolved from there. It was a good fit. And then they offered me um, this position. And I've been doing this um, full time for about four years now here. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's been it's been a wonderful experience because I get to do so many different things and work and learn about so many um, interesting areas of local history that aren't necessarily very well known. Right. That sounds like a perfect fit for everyone. Mm -hmm. So the Noble Maritime Collections Museum and your offices there, it's all in a former dormitory, right? Of uh, Correct. The retirement home that uh, was known as Sailor Snug Harbor, which is something I only was vaguely aware of until fairly recently. I learned more about it. For listeners who might not be familiar with uh, Sailor's Snug Harbor, what was that? Okay, so Sailor Snug Harbor was founded um, in 1801 um, by Robert Richard Randall, who was a a prominent New Yorker at the time um, of maritime family. And his whole, his philosophy 
um, with regards to founding the harbor was about returning the money that he had made and his family had made from sea ventures to the people who worked at sea. So he founded Sailor Snow Harbor to be a retirement home for aged, decrepit, and worn out sailors. And that's the, the term he used in his, in his will. And his will established a board of trustees who were going to oversee the operations. And it did a very unique thing where it didn't, it didn't put specific people on the board, it put positions. So prominent people in New York City, the mayor, the president and vice president of the Marine Society of the city of New York, an organization that the Randall family was very involved in, the head of the Department of Commerce, just all of these powerful positions. And he had wanted the home to be on his property in lower Manhattan, like where Washington Square Park is now and NYU. And the trustees saw that that was very valuable real estate. So they decided to come out here to Staten Island, purchase more affordable land, and kind of, and rent out the lots in Lower Manhattan for for income. Um, so they they came out here and they started building the first building on site in 1831. And when the doors opened in 1833, they accepted third like about 33, 35 people, and the sailors that came to live here had to fulfill certain criteria. But if you fulfilled that criteria, you could come here and live here for the rest of your life, room and board, medical care. Um, and it persisted with providing that degree of care until uh, the Staten Island facility until 1976, but ultimately until 2005 in North Carolina, which is where they moved in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, they served about 10,000 sailors at the Staten Island facility. Um, and the site just grew and grew, right? Currently, it's an 83-acre site, but at its prime, it was 126 acres. And there were seven dormitory buildings, two hospitals, you know, a music hall, a great hall where they would, you know, have a library and just activities for the sailors to do. The music hall is actually the second oldest music hall like that performing venue in the city, second only to Carnegie Hall, that has continuously presented performances. Wow. And there was a self-sustaining farm, just all of the, it was really a self-sustaining community in a lot of ways. And it provided free care for these men who lived very difficult lives. <laughs> Going to sea was not an easy job. And particularly in the 19th century and earlier when you know, you would leave your home at 12 years old and right. never go back, right? So a lot of these men lost family connections. And if a place like this didn't exist, they wouldn't necessarily have had anywhere to go. And there were similar organizations throughout the country and probably around the world. But this one was one of the largest and it attracted people from all over the world. And there's still quite a few buildings standing from Sailor Snug Harbor, right? And I understand yeah. there, are, there are other museums besides yours in some of those buildings. Yes. Right? So we are located in one of what is called the front five buildings. It's the front five buildings that are facing the water, the Kilvan Call, um, which is which at that time and still today is one of the busiest waterways in the world. So we are in a former dormitory and just Right next door in Main Hall, which was the first building on site, is the New House Gallery for Contemporary Art. Mm -hmm. A few doors down from that is the Staten Island Museum. The Children's Museum is also on site. Um, several other renters um, that use space here, including the Art Lab, which is a school for people of all ages and abilities to learn how to do different types of art. The and Snug Harbor Cultural Center um, does have a farm and is um, and helps kind of just run and organize what's going on here on site. And for lighthouse buffs, I'll just mention that you're not that far from the National Lighthouse Museum. No, nope. no, nope. we're about two miles from the Staten Island Ferry, and the National Lighthouse Museum is right there. Yeah, right next to the the ferry mm -hmm. there. So if lighthouse buffs should check out uh, some of your the Noble Maritime Collection Museum and uh, maybe the other other museums they can visit there. Absolutely. When they come to Staten Island. And back to Sailor Snug Harbor, I understand there are some things 
in your collection and your museum that relate to, uh, to that? Yes. So we have here at the Noble Maritime Collection, the art and artifact collection of the trustees of Sailor Snook Harbor. So it's placed here on semi-permanent loan um, because all that organization does still exist, the trustees of Sailor Snook Harbor, and they still give pensions to sailors who fulfill their requirements, but they no longer operate a retirement home. Mm -hmm. So all of the art, all of the objects, all of the paper that they created in their nearly 200 year history of running a retirement home is kind of divided up. So we have here their art and artifacts. SUNY Maritime College in Fort Schuyler in the Bronx has their document collection. And we do also have here our own document collection and objects that have been donated to us um, since this museum has been located at Snug Harbor. And that's, you know, it can range from furniture that was here, things that were, were made by the sailors who lived here. Some of it is um, documents that were left behind um, because these buildings were desolate for a while and things were found in different buildings and just people in the community kind of took things and things were just left here. And um, we've benefited from that because we do have a small, it's only a, a very small collection of documents compared to what they would have created in their history. Sure. But um, it's been fun for me to research and we also have a pretty active um, intern pro like internship program here where we can get um, people from colleges and undergrad and graduate programs to come in and work with this, these documents and this history. And you have exhibits related to Sailor Snug Harbor, right? Yeah, so we just closed a long-term exhibition about the daily life here, what it would have been like um, for sailors to live here day to day. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have an exhibition called Treasures of Sailor Snug Harbor, which goes into the history of the founding of the site and highlights a collection of paintings and ship models that were collected by the trustees to decorate the halls of the buildings. Mm -hmm. And we also have a dormitory room recreation that shows what a typical sailor's dormitory here would have looked like about 1900. And we have the, the writing room. So here at Snook Harbor, they had um, like writing rooms and reading rooms, basically rooms for sailors to do certain activities and our building was used um, for a writing room where they would have provided paper, stationery, you know, ways for sailors to write memoirs or write letters. And we have that kind of set up to tell a little bit more of Sailor Snug Harbor history there. Sounds great. I've got to get there. Yeah, <laughs> you should. <laughs> I will, I promise. Uh, so who was John A. Noble anyway? Why is your organization named for him? So John A. Noble was a local maritime artist in the most like active in the mid 20th century. And he was no, a local Staten Island guy who was just known, he was known in the community. And the, the our museum's founder did his last interview with him just a few weeks before he died. And she decided to create this museum to be just about him, his work, mm -hmm. his life in his home which is about a mile away from here, going in the direction of the, the ferry and the National Lighthouse Museum. Um, the house still stands. And she was just very attracted to just his body of work and his story. He was an artist, but he was also a sailor. And he combined his love of both art and, and you know working at sea together to create a body of work that is unique when you think of maritime art. His father, also John Noble, was a maritime artist as well, but he was more of a romantic painter. It was what, like, he created work that is more kind of what you think of when you think of maritime art, a ship in the distance, you're on the shore, it's, it's separate, it's from a distance. But Noble wanted to show the, the other side of it. What was it like to work on those ships? What mm -hmm. was, you know, how was it dangerous? All of these things. So when he was a teenager, against his parents' wishes, he got a job on a schooner. And he was, I want to, he wanted to go to sea. He wanted to experience it himself. And it was when he was working there that he also learned a lot about Sailor Snook Harbor, which is how the two subjects <laughs> kind of connect. Yeah. Um, 
where he would tell uh, he would be he would befriended the sailors um, that he worked with and a lot of them would tell him you know oh there's the sailor snuck harbor and one day I'm gonna live there and he you know he was really into that whole idea of there being this safe harbor for these men to go at the end of their career and then when he got married had kids he settled here on Staten Island just a few blocks away from Sailor Snow Harbor and as he got older he would come here and he would hang out with the guys and he just really enjoyed kind of being here and being surrounded by people who had been a part of a world he documented in his art so by the the early 90s, the city was giving cultural um, cultural organizations the opportunity to move into some of the buildings here at Snug Harbor. And um, the museum's founder, Aaron Urban, just decided, you know, this is, this is perfect. We can go there. We can take over a building there. It gives us the opportunity to expand and to take on Sailor Snug Harbor history as part of our mission because preserving Sailor Snug Harbor was so important to noble so that's that's what she did she came here and with money from the city and don't donated time and labor she and volunteers restored this building and um it's that same volunteerism and kind of like can do ism that um she and a volunteer crew are doing at robin's reef lighthouse now as well i definitely want to talk about that so you're talking about erin urban erin urban yes yeah I do want to talk more about her and, of course, about the lighthouse. I was just thinking, as uh, you were talking about the kind of the two sides of maritime history mm-hmm. and the, the history of uh, sailors and that kind of thing, the more romantic uh, idea that people have about about the subject and the more realistic, kind of harsher, uh, you know, true uh, side of it. And I was thinking the same thing applies to lighthouses. You know, people have very romantic notions of lighthouses, mm-hmm. and I always... When uh, I hear things about that, I, I always tell people, you know, lighthouse keeping wasn't as romantic as you think. It was, it was hard work. It was. It was yeah. very hard work and was uh, quite dangerous at a lot of these places. Mm-hmm. And uh, especially the isolated lighthouses that are out, you know, surrounded by water and Robin's Reef lighthouse would certainly fall into that category. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, in the, uh, in the, I don't know if you've heard in the French lighthouse service, there's an old saying, on fair a parody, hell and heaven. There's the heaven lighthouses and on the mainland, you know, or on large islands, and you've got the hell lighthouses just stuck out in the water. Some of them mm-hmm. very isolated. Robin's Reef would be more towards the the unfair uh, <laughs> side of side of things. Yes. Um, so let's talk about the museum's stewardship of Robin's Reef Lighthouse. Okay. First, uh, for people who might not know, could you just say a little bit about the lighthouse? Maybe uh, it's uh, just a brief bit about its uh, its basic history, where it where it is, and what kind of a lighthouse it is. Okay, so Robin's Reef Lighthouse was originally commissioned by the U.S. government in 1837. It's kind of if you're coming in from open ocean through the through the narrows into New York Harbor, it sits at the mouth of the Kilvan Cole. Mm -hmm. which is um which at the time was the busiest waterway in the world and it's still one of the busiest and it gets very very shallow there (laughs) and it's really the perfect place for there to be a lighthouse and it serves a critical purpose even now at just warning how shallow it gets there and originally it was a it was a granite structure that was lit for the first time in 1839 and by um, the early 1880s, they removed that granite structure and they put the spark plug um, lighthouse structure that is there today. And it serves as a critical aid to navigation. It is still an active lighthouse, but in about 2009, the General Services Administration was you know, offering up lighthouses to organizations that could restore them and take care of them. So the Coast Guard still maintains the light. <laughs> NOAA still has equipment out there to track weather, but in terms of preventing the structure from crumbling, that's where we came in. Um, so Erin Urban, again, she, she has this ability to get people together for a common good and just fix something, mm-hmm. right? So she saw this as an opportunity to, again, expand our mission more you know, a different aspect of working waterfront history in this area. Sure. And also, you know, to, for the sake of historic preservation. 
Um, and it also has, you know, a good story and there's ways to tie that in. And it was just, it was a good project. We applied and we were, we were selected to become the steward. And since then, by now it's 2010, um, we've been working on restoring it with the ultimate goal of just getting it out, getting people out there, making it accessible. And you say it has a great story. Uh, the story that I think of with Robin's Reef is uh, relates to one of the most famous lighthouse keepers in American history. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would put her right at the, certainly within the top uh, three or four most famous lighthouse keepers, mm-hmm. I'd say, in the country, not just women lighthouse keepers, but keepers, period. And that would be Kate Walker. Mm-hmm. Uh, who was Kate Walker and what was so special about her? Catherine Walker. I uh, was born in Germany in 1848, and she immigrated to America in 1882 with her young son after her first husband died, yeah. and she settled in Sandy Hook, New Jersey, where she worked at, like, in, a, in the officer's quarters at a base there, and there she met John Walker, who at the time was keeper of Sandy Hook Lighthouse, and they, they married and she moved there and she liked working at a lighthouse, right? She kind of helped out. She learned about the job. You know, she was able to keep a garden, you know, and then he got transferred to Robin's Reef Lighthouse. Very different experience. Um, and they moved out there. He was the second keeper at the new Spark Plug Lighthouse. Right. And they moved out there and she hated it. <laughs> she she's like, I can't go for a walk. I can't have a garden. I can't do any of these things. She refused to unpack her trunk. She didn't want to stay. But slowly she settled in. She learned about the job. She was her husband's official assistant. Um, and then, so this was 1886. Right around then they also welcomed a daughter. So now there's two kids out there. And as someone who has spent some time out there, it's not a lot of room. Mm-hmm. Um, but then four years later, 1890, her, John dies of bronchopneumonia. And uh, as the story goes, as he's being taken in a boat to Staten Island, gravely ill, he tells her, you know, mind the light, you know, make sure that it keeps shining. Yeah. So she, she took those words to heart and that's what she did. She was very quickly ordered by the lighthouse department to, to vacate. And she was like, no. <laughs> not, not going to do that. <laughs> and she had two young children. She wanted to do this job. That's what she wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And they offered it to several people, um, men who turned it down and they didn't, they didn't want to give her the job. They're just like, no, you're four foot 10. You weigh 98 pounds. Like you're, you can't, you can't do this job. But in 1895, they officially appointed her keeper and by this time, um, her son was about 18, 19. They lied about his age to get him to be her official assistant. Mm-hmm. And he did some of like the, you know, rowing the boat to Staten Island to get mail, supplies, those types of things where she did the actual um, lighthouse keeping for the most part. Mm-hmm. She enjoyed it. She liked keeping the logbook, keeping track of what was going on at, um, in the harbor. And she enjoyed the work. It was hard work, but she, she enjoyed it. Yeah. And she reached a point where she loved it so much out there that whenever she went to the mainland, she was like, oh, it's too much. <laughs> there's like, st- there's too much stimulation. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, you know, her son gets married, has kids, has a wife. And at one point they're all living out there. <laughs> and there's just a lot of people living out at the lighthouse. And I think one of the reasons why her story resonates so much with people is that, I mean, it's an immigrant story. It's a single mother story. And I think there's a lot of stuff there that people identify with. And, you know, she was a single working mother who didn't really speak the language. You know, she kind of learned on her feet how to speak English and how to communicate with the lighthouse department and the people who had to come and then she had to contact for various things. You know, she only retired because she had to, (laughs) because they they passed the law that said that um, you couldn't be a lighthouse keeper over the age of 70, and she was already 71. So in 1919, she had to, she had to leave. And I imagine that must have been very, very difficult, because by that point, she had lived out there over 30 years. You know, she moved with her daughter to Staten Island. 
at a place very close to the water where she could just walk down um, to, to the, the water line and be able to see the lighthouse in the distance. It's an amazing story. What a, what a life she had. Uh, do you have photos and or artifacts related to Kate Walker and the Noble Maritime Collection? We do. It's, it's really actually remarkable when we were putting together the exhibition that we have here. We were put in contact through an artist that we know with this young artist who's also an artist, a young artist, who said, you know, I think I'm related to the woman who worked at the lighthouse. And we're like, hmm. huh. So he put us in touch with his aunt, who is the family historian, and she is Kate Walker's great, great granddaughter. And she had a treasure trove of material. So we had some stuff that we were able to collect, you know, newspaper articles about her, photographs from that. But she was able to give us so much rich information about how Robin's Reef was also a home, right? It wasn't just a place where she worked. It was also her home for herself, for her children, for her grandchildren. So on display here at the museum, we have some items of Kate Walker's from the lighthouse. So we have the table that was in her sitting room where she would sit and keep her logbook. We have um, records because we know that she liked to listen to her Victrola and we have some of the records that she used to listen to. We have some items that she made, a vase she had out of the lighthouse. And this is where it's the, the Staten Island aspect is so unique because Staten Island is part of a major city, but also kind of feels like a small town and her, her family, like she moved here when she retired. She could have gone back to New Jersey, right? That's where she had lived before she went to Robins Reef, but she came here and her family and her descendants are still here. Um, so that was able to give us, they were able to provide us with so much rich history that we might not have known all the details of otherwise. I'm wondering if you personally have done more research on Kate Walker, like have you been to the National Archives looking for stuff? Yes. Yeah, so when I was preparing this exhibition, um, I did go down to the archive, National Archives in D.C., but it's, it's interesting because, um, as you probably know, there, had, there were several fires at storage facilities that housed a lot of um, like military records, lighthouse department records. So there's unfortunately not an excessive amount of of records related to Robin's Reef and all none of her log books still exist, um, unfortunately. But it was really a fascinating experience to go and look through what did exist because some of it was charred. Like it was like kind of burned and like it still smelled of fire, like the fire mm -hmm. had just occurred. Um, so there wasn't, there was, unfortunately wasn't too, too much there, but there was some correspondence related to, you know, collision she had seen out in the harbor. But um, most of what we have and copies of documents that we have, we got from the family mm -hmm. um, and not from the National Archives. Another person I interviewed for this podcast some time ago was Elizabeth Spires, mm -hmm. who wrote uh, what I think is a wonderful children's book called Kate's Light. Mm -hmm. Kate Walker, did you work with her on that at all? So um, her publisher very kindly reached out to me very early in the process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I could tell right off the bat that it was it was well researched, which I, I, I always like to, to see evidence of that. But they were very they wanted it to be as accurate as humanly possible. So they really, they, they gave me early drafts. They took my recommendations. It was really um, wonderful that they were um, that communicative with me. And they also, you know, in the, in the book, they put some promotion for the museum in there and our exhibition here. And it was, yeah, it was, it was lovely. Well, it was well-researched. That's what yes. I liked about it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Like, there's been a lot of children's books about lighthouses, not necessarily all uh, accurate. Yes, I liked that it was um, it was a children's book. Like it was geared towards a younger audience, but they wanted it to be accurate. They wanted it to tell the, the true story without, you know, it being too fanciful or anything like that, which I, I really enjoyed because it's a, it's a good, powerful and exciting story all on its own. Absolutely. I mm -hmm. completely agree. So back to the, the lighthouse, the actual structure itself, what is happening these days? I know some work has been done out there. Uh, what's happening currently with, uh, with the lighthouse? So the big project that they're working on now is getting the outside painted. So when the Coast Guard was in charge of the maintenance, it was painted relatively frequently. Um, I would say probably maybe once a decade based on photos that I've seen. But now it hasn't been painted since about... 
I want to say 2005, 2006, mm-hmm. and it shows. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it's supposed to be like the day mark is white and brown, and it's looking more like brown and brown these days. So yeah. um, mm-hmm. that's a big, that's the next big hurdle that that they're working on out there. Those cast iron lighthouses will uh, start looking bad after, I'd say, between five and 10 years. Yes, and it's up. been more like 15, 17 yeah. years, something like that. I have plenty of experience with that. I, <laughs> exactly. Uh, although I think the the top part, the uh, the what would be just below the lantern level at the top, mm-hmm. that would probably be considered the, the watch, watch gallery. Level. Mm-hmm. watch gallery uh was painted uh not too long ago right? yes we started doing that it's already needed it's needed several coats <laughs> already yeah. but um we, we did that in about 2018 i want to say we painted the black that's above the lantern gallery and the white of the watch gallery and it just it pops now like when you take the Staten island ferry you can see it more just yeah. with that pop of bright paint you said we did that just now does that mean that you personally were involved in that um, I ha- not as much the last few years, but I did work on the painting. I used to go out there relatively often, and yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun. It's the best view. <laughs> it's it's a beautiful place to be, and yeah, I've done a l- lot of projects out there <laughs> over the uh-huh. years. So, who does? Uh, was it a contractor, or was it all done by volunteers? The the recent uh, painting that's been done out there. Everything that's been done out there. Um, with the exception of one or two projects, has been volunteer. Mm-hmm. Um, so we get out there. On our board is the president of Miller's Launch, which is a launch boat company out here, and they take us out there for free. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we this project wouldn't be possible without without them. Yeah. And we also have a company, a local company, Armorica Sales, who um, donates all the paint, and it's really. A volunteer project. It's a labor of love <laughs> where people who are just interested in preserving it have given their time and their expertise towards the project. As everybody, I think most certainly our, our listeners would, would know that the sea levels are rising more. It seems like we're having more severe storms like here on mm-hmm. the New Hampshire seacoast. We just had a storm with major flooding last week. Uh, have you noticed anything as far as uh, these storms and the sea level affecting the lighthouse at all? Is that something you guys are aware of? Well, we it's keeping the lighthouse sealed and protected um, mm-hmm. from, from moisture is, has been one of the biggest ongoing um, issues that we faced out there. Yeah. You know, the, the lighthouse was damaged in Hurricane Sandy, which is already almost 10 years ago. But we were remarkably lucky there were lighthouses in this area that were just wiped right off their foundation. Old so, Orchard Shoal, yeah. It yeah, mm-hmm. it was lost completely. So this had some damage. It set us back, but it wasn't anything that we couldn't come back from. And we finally, actually just this season, got a working ventilation fan out there to try to prevent the moisture from settling and kind of damaging work <laughs> that has been done out there. But yeah, I mean, protecting it from storms is a concern. Sure. We just have to see. <laughs> yeah, well, it's something everybody in the lighthouse world is, is worried about. A challenge that we're all facing. So, uh, are there any other specific restoration projects in the works at this point? Um, they're more future. So, like I said, we've been um, the project has been done with volunteers, but it's kind of reaching a point where. Um, we have to start paying for some of the things that need to be done out there. So access is a huge issue because right now you have to climb a ladder straight, <laughs> straight up to get up there. Um, figuring out access, getting railings um, put on um, is there aren't a lot of <laughs> there aren't a lot of railings um, up at the top. You know, I'm I'm tall and the railings come to like just above my knee. So it's like it's not necessarily the safest place to be. So there's a lot of big things that need to be addressed before it would be safe to take people out there. Wow, that's a low railing. I'm at, uh, yeah, but up at the Lantern Gallery, you have to climb through this tiny dog door to get out there, and the railings are very low. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So you mentioned access, issues mm-hmm. of access. Uh, are there plans for uh, public access eventually once it's restored? In a perfect world yes <laughs> um you know i think we like the idea of potentially getting school children out there or the public in some way a lot of those details haven't exactly been worked out because you know it is isolated out there we have to figure out 
you know, it would be limited in when we could actually do it because at low tide, you can't get a boat. (laughs) You can't get a boat in there. So there would be a lot of complications doing that. But yes, I mean, ultimately the goal is to get people out there in some way. It's just a matter of figuring out how. So I think about the last time I photographed the lighthouse was something like 2008 from the Staten Island Ferry. And uh, I know, so obviously some work's been done since then. Was some of the glass replaced in the lighthouse? Well, so the the biggest project that I think has made the biggest difference to both the people working out there and what it looks like from a distance is the windows. So when the lighthouse was automated in 1966, there were just steel plates put over all the windows to protect Mm -hmm. it from the elements. We, in about, in, I want to say it was 2016, we contracted a woodworker from Virginia, actually, who came up and over the course of a week, we went out there every single day for about a week, 10 days to, for him to assess how to remove the steel and then how to get the windows out because the plan was to remove the original windows, restore them, and then put them back in. So the windows that are there now are the original windows from the 1830s. And it made a huge difference because before that working out there was, you know, dark, (laughs) very dark and, you know, damp. And once the windows were there, we had ventilation, we had light. Um, It made a huge difference. And, you know, it looks, it makes the place look more, active you know you can see the windows and they look like you know windows you would have in a house you know just normal windows oh that's great i know how that kind of thing can bring a place back to life a lot of lighthouses either the windows were blocked up or or they put in those glass block windows that you can't see through Mm -hmm. or traditional windows are are so much nicer for people who might be interested uh and obviously uh, our listeners are interested in lighthouses and uh, they love to help with projects like this. So are you looking for donations for the lighthouse? Two-part question. And, or are you looking for volunteers to help with projects there? Volunteers always. Um, We can always use um, people with, you know, who might have unique skill sets that would be appropriate for the project. And, you know, donations are always appreciated as well. Okay. And how can people find out more about donating and volunteering? Well, they can reach out to us. Um, The general email address would be info, just I-N-F-O at noblemaritime.org. And then we could forward that along to the appropriate people. As um, Erin Urban, who is running the project, is retired, but we have ways to get into contact with her um, and with our board who help oversee the project. And we could get those inquiries to the proper people. Sure. And the the website is noblemaritimecollection.org? noblemaritime.org noble just noblemaritime.org yes. okay thank you i've looked at it i just uh, <laughs> flipped my, my memory for a second there again back to erin urban the uh founding executive director of the noble maritime collection you referred to her uh earlier she wrote a book on robin's reef lighthouse which i happen to have right next to me here mm-hmm. perspective robin's reef that's a really nice book with a lot of historic uh, photos of kate walker and other things that are a great job with that and there's also uh our various artworks depicting robin's reef lighthouse included in the book i think you may have played a role in that book <laughs> so i was wondering about that but also is that book available from uh Yes. Maritime collection. Mm-hmm. So that book we published after um, we opened up the exhibition here. So it's it's kind of two parts. It's a catalog of the more contemporary art from that exhibition, but also tells the history of the lighthouse and the history of Kate Walker. Um, it is available both in our museum shop here. It's also available on our website. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, a lot of the research for that book I contributed to it was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, and we published it in house. Oh, well, it's a handsome, it's a handsome book. You did a nice job. So if you want to say a little bit more about that exhibit, you've mentioned the exhibit in the Noble Maritime Collection Museum on Robin's Reef Lighthouse. That's a is that a permanent exhibit? It's semi it's <laughs> semi semi-permanent, um, just because it is the only exhibit we have here that tells that part, that story of our mission. So it's been a long-term exhibition that's kind of been broken up into three parts. There's the, a room dedicated to Kate Walker and her history and her family and the work that she had to do from day to day. 
there's a room that tells the story of the lighthouse itself that leads into our stewardship and the work that we've been doing out there. And then there's an art section where we've reached out to local artists to do their interpretation of the lighthouse. And we have pieces that represent um, the original structure that are more like older prints. And then we have some modern stuff that was done for the exhibition, including an etching done by Kate Walker's great, great, great grandson who put, who put us in touch with his aunt. Wow. That's great. And I mentioned the Staten Island ferry earlier. I have photographed the lighthouse from the ferry a couple of times. Is that, if people ask, how do I photograph the lighthouse? Is that your best recommendation? Any other ideas about that? Yeah. So from the ferry you get a good view it's on it's in line with the statue of liberty right so if you're on that side of the boat and you're looking for it you'll you'll find it you could also do it from the promenade by the staten island ferry um, in saint george and you can get some good views of the lighthouse there as well and along the promenade about a mile kind of towards where we are here at snug harbor um, there are different views you could get uh, of the lighthouse but yeah either from the shore or from the ferry ferry is obviously a little closer <laughs> uh-huh what state is robin's reef lighthouse in is it in new jersey or new york okay this is a <laughs> question that has come up so i think technically it is new jersey mm-hmm. i believe this that's true yes but we um, have claimed it <laughs> here in New York because the the lighthouse depot that Kate Walker was always in communication with was here in Tompkinsville on Staten Island. So her her depot, the place where she wrote to and talked to, was the Staten Island location. Right. Yeah, and that's yeah. where she went for supplies, and that's where her kids went to school, and it was a Staten Island connection. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to mm-hmm. me. I mean, yeah, and, and on Google Maps, I think it's on the New Jersey uh, side of the border. I think but, it technically is. Yeah. yeah, but historically, I think it has more relationship to uh, to New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, one final question for you for bonus points, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, what has been your personal favorite thing about your work for the Noble Maritime Collection? Okay, so I think, and this is going to be kind of a nerdy answer, but I think... I I enjoy learning about history that people don't know about and being even a little bit a part of sharing that history. So I have a history background um, and I just like digging, digging into a subject and learning anything I possibly can about it and then trying to distill that to others. And I feel like, in my role here, I've been able to do that, not just with Sailor Snow Harbor, but with Robin's Reef and sharing those stories and, you know, interacting with people and hearing their takes on it has, has been a lot of fun um, because it's not something people know about, you know, like I am born and bred Staten Islander and I did not know about Sailor Snow Harbor until I came here. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just, it's not something people know about. And, you know, Robin's Reef is uh, the story of Robin's Reef Lighthouse and Kate Walker is something that people identify with. Yeah, maybe they don't identify with staying up all night and, you know, keeping a light going, but they identify with the hard work and the family and all that stuff. And it's just a way to relate these stories to people and have them, you know, identify with aspects of those stories. Yeah. Has been that, important. Not nerdy at all. <laughs> <laughs> It's great to hear that you're so enthusiastic about uh, what you do and the his- you've got such tremendous history to draw from there. Yes, uh, with the fast. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, York Harbor, I mean, geez, there's no end to the, the stories there. But even just with the lighthouse, there's so much. So Megan Beck, I want to thank you so much for spending time with me today. It's a pleasure talking with you. Thank you for having me. This is a lot of fun. To learn more about the Noble Maritime Collections Museum and their stewardship of Robin's Reef Lighthouse, visit noblemaritime.org. They also have a very active Facebook page. One of the subjects I spoke about with Megan Beck was Sailor Snug Harbor, the old retirement home on Staten Island that's now home to several museums and cultural centers. On one of the next episodes of Lighthearted, we'll be talking with another guest about the interesting history of Sailor's Snug Harbor. 
Next, we're going to have another one of our Be a Lighthouse segments. Everyone knows that part of the appeal of lighthouses is the fact that they were built to save lives and property, and they stand as symbols of hope and caring. With our Be a Lighthouse segments, we're calling attention to people and organizations who are acting as shining examples of generosity and compassion in our communities. Today's Be a Lighthouse subject is from Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Scarves tied around poles were recently spotted in that city, along with notes that said, If you need this scarf, please take it and be warm and safe. The person behind this act of kindness is Annika Sharak, an 18-year-old Oak Ridge High School senior who enjoys helping others. And this isn't the first time Annika has performed selfless acts of caring. Michelle, you recently spoke with Annika via Zoom. Yes, I did, Jeremy. And what a sweet girl she is. She has done so many great things for her community and is continuing to do so. And she has lots of plans to keep doing that in the future. Well, that's good news. And thank you for doing this interview, Michelle. Let's listen to your conversation with Annika Sharak now. I'm speaking today with Annika Sharak, who is an 18-year-old high school senior in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Thanks for joining us for our Be a Lighthouse segment, Annika. No problem. Residents of Oak Ridge, Tennessee, started noticing scarves tied around poles with notes inside that said, if you need this scarf, please take it and be warm and safe. And the notes were signed from CT and Nana. After some investigating, they discovered that these scarves were being made and left by Annika herself. So, Annika, can you tell us where in Tennessee is Oak Ridge? Is it near Nashville or Knoxville? Is it a big city? Um, Well, it's not really big. Um, It's more towards Knoxville. uh, And it's kind of a smaller kind of city. I think roughly there's like 25,000 to 50,000 people. Okay. In here, um, yeah, it's kind of one of the smaller secluded. It's people. I mean, it's kind of known around here. It's a nice place to live. Yeah, that's all I can say. Oh, good, good. So I understand that you play soccer. I used to. You used I to used play to soccer. play soccer. I did. I played it since uh, I was four, and I um, stopped my freshman year. And now I've started getting into kickboxing. Oh, very cool. Kickboxing is a lot of fun and it's very, very good exercise. Yes, I am. So other than that, what other things do you enjoy doing? Um, I'd say hanging out with my friends, um, creating, like doing things for the community. Like I said, helping younger kids um, with 4-H because I also do that outside I like to play basketball outside. Um, I've just now started getting into reading books. Great. Great. As a future English teacher, I like to hear that. (laughs) So how old were you when you decided to start making scarves for people? It was this year. It was this year. This year. 18. 18. 18, Wow. That's pretty, that's pretty tremendous. So was it your Nana that taught you how to make these scarves or did you teach yourself or watch your tutorial? Well, uh, my Nana, she had like the, so the material for the scarves, she has dementia. And so over time she forgot to do it. So she handed it to me and she was like, here's some scrap fabric, um, do what you please. And so I was with my mom and I was like, and she told me, she was like, she was like, this, this could be a good idea. And I was like, okay, yeah, that could be a good idea. And then she helped me, um, think of a way to kind of like make the scarves. I mean, they're not too intricate, but they're something. Yeah, that I just I think it's great I, and I think they're beautiful so what is it that sparked your decision to make these I would say because um we noticed it was starting to get colder and then we noticed that um since COVID hit more unfortunate things have happened to people so we decided to create scarves since it was getting colder and then once we noticed the weather dropped we were like oh perfect time let's go put them up so you know what makes you do these kinds of things for other people obviously you're a very caring person uh I would say the happiness and like when people see them and they have uh, a sort of hope come to them and they say things like oh my gosh this made my day better or oh my goodness it's so great to see that there's actually people who are still in the world trying to give back and stuff like absolutely that. it gives them that spark of reassurance that there's still people in the world that that do good things that's great and that's really important too yeah that, that people still have that hope so if you don't mind my asking what do the initial ct stand for 
CT, um, they stand for my friend. She's also goes to high school and her name's Claudia Trebalka. Uh, she's in my grade and she helped make a few. That's why I put her on there. She also helped with it a little bit during the time. I think she made about like four, but yeah. Oh, okay. I was very curious about that. I saw, you know, from CT and Nana. So I just yeah. wanted to ask if who that was. So I understand that making scarves isn't the only kind-hearted act that you've done for those in your community. Can you tell our listeners about the other wonderful things that you've done? I've done the scarves, and then I also have done, this was with 4-H, but I helped clean a uh, place that people can stay. So if people have um, uh, loved ones in the hospital, but they don't have enough room to stay with them, and they're um, out of state or don't have any ways to go, it's called the Ronald McDonald house and they can stay in there. And I went outside wow. and since I know that they have kids uh, cleaned out a little playground and I made it usable for the kids to go out there and play and made it kind of clean and dust free. Also, um, I gave uh, little lunch packs that kind of you can give to truck drivers to make it to make their day a little bit better. And then I also gave Duncan cards. They were five dollars each. I gave about like 50 of those to just people I walked around Oak Ridge and I just gave them to people who I thought would make their day better. That's, that's just really great to hear. It's so nice to see, you know, the younger generation being kind and wanting to make other people happy like that. It's wonderful. So what's next for you? Do you have any plans to do more things or do you have plans for after high school? Well, I do have plans to do more things. Like I, um, like was said, I'm still working on the scarves. I'm putting more out. I'm working on some more right now. Had work though, so it's kind of late a little bit, but we're getting there. And for the future, I plan on going to medical school and becoming a forensic pathologist. That's great. Very, very good. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Annika. It's, no it was very, very inspiring hearing your story. Annika will be getting a Be a Lighthouse Award mailed to her by the U.S. Lighthouse Society. If any listeners have ideas for future Be a Lighthouse segments, please email me at jeremy at uslhs.org. The segments can relate to a lighthouse organization or not. We just want to know about people doing good in our communities. The comedian Margaret Cho once said, and I quote, Sometimes when we are generous in small, barely detectable ways, it can change someone else's life forever, end quote. If you listen to this podcast using Apple Podcasts, please rate and review us. And please spread the word about this podcast on social media. Check out uslhs.org to learn more about the Passport Program, tours, preservation grants, and all the things the U.S. Lighthouse Society offers. Remember that donations help support this podcast and all the Society's missions. To everyone out there working to save lighthouses or any kind of history, Thank you for everything you do. We're all on the same team. To all our regular listeners and to our new ones, thank you so much for listening and keep a good light. Bye.